is Teresita Blanco the Office Sister and today we're reading Saturn Astro Monkey King. This is chapter 7, part 1. King told his son that he, that he had not made any headway with his night companions. For the, following months, uh, for the following summer months, he visited all of the clan leaders of the Nagas, and they had unanimously uh, agreed not to follow his, uh, his commands. And something had changed in Monkey King, and the Nagas who sense it, and they refused to trust in him till he got his head in the game, and said so he could no longer be the Monkey King. Abel, Abel removed his king mask, and he became a human again. He could not remember the last time somebody had ever called him Abel. Abel was an name he had received from his nagging mother, and while growing up with wisdom and virtue, he had always been able to, to learn things faster than his peers. It seemed to his mother that he was able to do things that were thought impossible for her kin. And at the time, the nagas were not aware of what he was, though his mother always knew that he was different. And to Father Ponto, at this fact, she had named him Abel. The silence around him now awaited at him, tearing him limb from limb, and when the silence left him, he felt nauseated, and staggering to walk, he made his way towards a rabbit hole beneath a tree, and he dwelt his original occupant and he rested within. I really wanted to, thought Abel, and he closed his eyes and he dreamed the dream again, and by tapping to the collective memory of his people, he dreamed of a world that, ne that, that he never knew. And his consciousness then sank deeper as he recalled his first major fight with his brother Marduk. And Marduk and Abel had always been at odds, and the source of the conflict stemmed from Abel's desire to be the leader of the siblings. And the other siblings always went along with Marduk, said just because he was one year older. And one day, when Marduk's uh, decision almost, and one day when Marduk's decision almost faded in your eye, he challenged Marduk for his position, and Marduk said with his usual melancholic manner. What happened was unfortunate. It, it's hard to um, it's hard to learn its limits, and it has. And we should be happy it escaped with his life. It should not have been fighting such an overwhelming force to begin with. You should have stopped it, revealed Abel. And he added, "I should be the leader. I don't know why you. I don't know why everyone's always going along with all of your stupid ideas." Because I am oldest. I am oldest, said my duke. God, that is your response for everything. And you're only older for one year, said, said, said Abel. And he remembered how his mother had entered the room to stop him from jumping at his brother's stroke. And since both were terrible at fighting and both were selling our canines, Abel devised, devised what he considered a brilliant little game to end the fight. And they were to have a competition to see who could gather the most followers in a three month period. And after analyzing his prospects, Mardu went to hell to gather the favor of the Hellions and to win them over, he would need his mother's death sight. And he came to her and said, Mother, I need a weapon to protect myself because I was born so weak. Shall I help yourself to whatever strong weapon you can carry from the armory? And these days I rarely bother to summon the energy to use them, to use them in battle, said his mother coolly. And Mardu looked through her stash and he found the hollow vessel of the demon sight, Lucifer. And to make proper use of the weapon, one needed a fresh demon core. And when and when Godava saw Marduk's weapon on shore, she commented, That weapon is no good for you, even with the added benefit of controlling demons. And there is a way to control the lab without being overcome by a stream of happiness. I already have a gloomy disposition, mother, so this weapon is not going to affect me in the least, answered Marduk sadly. Fine, so you sell. That weapon has been running away in the vault anyway, said his mother, Lady Godiva. And she added, and you need a fresh arch demon core, so do be careful when you go to hell. I will, Mom, said Marduk, giving a faint smile. And the following day, Marduk had gone to see his father, and after spending hours trying to get his attention, he managed to tell him, Dad, why do you, may why do you and Mother make me so weak? And pouting his father said, that was not our intention. I need a guardian to protect me, insisted Marduk. You have your siblings, just stick with them and you'll be safe, said his father. Hmm, but what if they're not around? I need something I can summon just in case the love scrambles or whatever, said Marduk in a clumsy fashion. And he knew that speaking that way always irritated his father. Just out with it, what do you want, said his father, sighing. I need an arch demon cord to carry with me. If I get in trouble, I can use a cord to summon the spirit body of the demon to aid me, said Marduk. So he, instead of going to hell to get an arch demon core, he just there, he got, he just went and asked his father for one, <laughs> without doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> I said, Mom, I need a powerful weapon, <laughs> one that helps me control an 
remind me of even if we have one, but we gotta, you need a fresh ice cream in court. And they found, Dad, can I have a fresh ice cream in court? Like, here you go, son. Try not to blow yourself up with it. <coughs> Getting up slowly, his father, his father opened a small cabinet and looked into all of his crystal. He found a round, murky orb, and the interior will resemble a storm cloud. And handed it to Marduk, he said, be careful when using this one. He has the power to possess others without the, without permission. So do try not to be around when calling him. And he's also good for calling us storms and destroying walls and battlements. What's his name? asked Marduk. His father wrote the name of the demon down, and Marduk nodded and pretended to read the name. And after binding it to the, the demon side, to the demon side, Marduk was able to call to command all that remained of the demons of hell. As for Ma, as for Abel. The monkey king, he did not manage to get a single ally, and when the promised death came, Mardu had won by a landslide, and since then he had stopped shadowing his brother's authority, and his only consolation prize was the 72 faces he had acquired on his little journey, and he always took care to look like the best version of whichever race he was trying to lord over, and only the nuggets about to give the poor able the monkey king a fair chance. And when Abel emerged from his rabbit hole, his human speech were filled with those of the rabbit, and a bird who had been watching him ship with surprise, and Abel jabbed uh, his newly grown ears until they sank. And in time he, he resembled more of, a squirrel, more of a squirrel than a monkey. And after singing the truth, he realized that what he had to do to win over his friends, but first he needed a bit of information. And screeching at the top of his lung, he called, he called force at a band of 30 hours, and about five of them perched on his person, wandering, wounding his hands with their talons, and trying to scoff out the pain. In imitation of his brother, he said, How fair the life in the forest? The elves gave a long hooting response. And in the rest of the world, as Abel, the elves then gave a short, repetitive hooting response, and not in Abel took the form to the form of the wind and made his way towards the town, and he was moderately happy to see the red mist straining behind him. And at the edge of the town, Rosalka took the form of a tent with a sign that read Animal Healer. And the town was called Bisbee, and due to its proximity with Lusitania, the great in Caro had become sick as of lately. And one of the farmers who saw the tent came to, inqu came to inside to inquire. He asked, What are you selling, traveler? Oh, wait, you're one of those fussy little critters. What was their name? Ah, yes, you're a monkey. What are you doing so far out of, out of, out of home, little monkey? I'm here to sell my service, said Abel. The farmer looked at the humble tent and picking up an iron chair, he asked, Is this a service? No, 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 the chair is not for sale. I am, you pay me and I help you. I'm an animal here, as the sign says, said Abel. The monkey king. An animal here. Why, I never heard of such a thing, said the farmer, suspicious. Well, it is a new thing made by the priest of Artisa, the goddess of the earth. Today's healers only treat humans and elves and other high minded creatures. But the animals like cattle need help too. Either that or the owners will either starve or be jailed for pay, failing to pay their taxes. Explain, explain Abel. Time, bro? Uh, 15 minutes. Why is it that I first see you now when the cattle are all sick? And you did not have anything to do with it, did you? asked the farmer suspicious. It is the land, sir. Your cattle, a sacred gas, have belonged to Ortiza and now they're getting punished. And I am here to bless the cows and grant you special permission to graze in this land, said Abel. The farmer was still unconvinced and after a short negotiation, the farmer agreed to give Abel his, two of his fattest cow, cows in exchange for saving the, the rest of the herd. And Abel brewed a vaccine and inoculated all the cows to make them resistant to the toxicity of the forest. And if the humans ate those cows, they would gain immunity to the passive spores breeds that are spewed out by the forest. And after the inoculation, Abel invented a silly little dance with flowers and he passed a bouquet over the head of each of the cow. And then he passed a head, an egg over their forehead and of, them, of the cows and their family. You know, like the human caretakers. Mm -hmm. He instructed them to throw both items at a crossroads late at night to complete their ritual. And after this verse it says, other people came from town to have their, him heal their animals, and most, were, and most of their problems were related to the forest, though there were a few that were of the more mundane biology. A pack horse with pastelette, chickens with head claws, and roosters with low virility. 
and this mundane problem had already been resolved by Abel's ancestors, I thought she had an easy solution which rarely required any real any real magic or science for that matter. How do you matter. know if a, if a chicken has a head cloth? Head, <laughs> head cold. Oh, I understood that you didn't even... No, you know, uh, fake chicken. Got it. The same way that the, the same way that humans get like weird chicken with it, they eat the chicken flu for that. Whatever. When the winter months came, he was asked to leave. He was asked to live in the Jones farm, and Eric Jones was the first farmer that Abel had helped. And one day he was visited upon by a noble servant, and her master called upon Abel because his dog was very sick. And Abel went with the servant to examine the dog. And then our mansion was just what you would expect with a fancy drapery, expensive vases, flowers, carpets, and columns. And then your manners looked so much alive that Abel suspected they had been made by the same group of people. And then the beloved bed in the master bedroom was agonizing, and Abel looked at the small critter and his owner bed in the room were left and right. And he was just lying there whimpering, and the dog was in fact a lotion, a type of toy dog with wavy hair. And he had a lion cut and a white head tooth, and the fact that he was whimpering was not a good sign. And lotions were known to be a, a very quiet dog breed, so like it's a dog that's known for being quiet while winding up in the top of his lungs. After examining the dog, Abel asked, Have you been feeling something new to your dog? Why, was it poison as the owner raising his voice? He was an elderly man with a silly silvery toupee. No, just, uh, no. just answer the question, what does he normally eat? And what has he recently started eating? Uh, say, said Abel, annoying. He just eats a scrap me and the kids feed him from the table, said the owner. I need you to be more specific. Does he eat chicken, beef, pig, cats, anything? insisted Abel. Recently we got a shipment of shrimp and we had never eaten shrimp and I see my boy fed, uh, fed, uh, fed the dog a small piece, said the owner. And Abel nodded, Abel nodded and went to his satchel and he brought a portion for the dog which he had to force the dog to drink and after five hours the dog was back to his old self again. And Abel then told the owner, be careful what you feed Ladybug and these dogs tend to be allergic. I mean they cannot eat certain food and just feed him the old stuff and be careful when offering him new types of food. Thank you Abel, said the owner as he walked Abel towards the door. As the days passed, Abel the monkey then started winning a little bit of fame as a bed and aside from eating animals, he would deal with the day-to-day -day aids of the populace and unlike hitters, he would not ask for sovereign prices nor turn away anyone who could not pay. And being an analogy, he always found someone for his customers to pay him. And now with material, because he would have them work for him. And by the time spring came, one of the healer Abel was getting around. And it eventually reached the years of his peers and Agus. And Pierre was the first of the Nagas to visit Abel the Monkey King. And he had not gone there in search of his king. He simply had given an incidental visit because he just happened to be in the neighborhood. And when he saw Abel, his man and said, You're looking better, Abel. That's monkey king to you, Pierre, said Abel, laughing. A king without his people is nothing, said Pierre. Yes, it is rather dull, dull to be here alone without anyone to load over, said Abel, sadly. You could try working on your magic a bit, suggested Pierre. I don't see the point to rush my studies or to continue them for that matter, said Abel, putting the water for the tea. And as the tree was brewed, he served his visitor. So, uh, sipping the tea, Pierre commented, without your magic, you have nothing else going for you. I do have all the power, said Abel coolly. So, just as Pierre without uh, pretending, uh, pretending to be interested, I can turn you into a hamster, said Abel, because I, ca I can turn into a hamster, said Abel, becoming a yellow and black colored lemon. Try again, buddy, said Pierre. The following foreign Abel dress was one of a blue androgynous fairy, fairy and its wings were like those of a damaged self plan, which folded backwards, and Pierre found this human uh, humoring, and Abel had other fairy forms in other forms, and after a couple of hours, Abel had shown the entire book of all of the transformations he could do, with the most of them being different flavors of rodents, fairies, goblins, humans, dolphins, and birds. Why don't you have a dragon form like your brother, asked Pierre. <laughs> You're just putting the finger in there. Why aren't you a freaking awesome dragon like your brother? 
you can just turn into a dragon. Sure, you can approximate it look wise, but mimicking their complex biology is not as easy as it sounds. In fact, it is easier for dragons to turn to other species than for other species to turn into dragons. Their bodies are just more malleable, explained Abel. Pity, I would certainly, I would certainly take seriously a dragon, said commented Pierre, and he added, you could try to get yourself a dragon transformation. It doesn't have to be too strong. It simply has to look the part. Meh, said Abel with a much enthusiasm. And the winter months came and with the were at and Abel had been expecting her for quite some time, and the birds were starting to arrive in the town of Beesby. And for days the birds have been examining have been examining Abel like a piece of meat. And even with the novelty of his form changes, he still carried himself with the air of a sneaky male. And when Gargata did arrive, she did not stay very long. And without a word she handed she handed Abel the five ampios and then went the four ampios and then went on her way. And Abel guessed that the ampios were missing Rusalka and putting Rusalka he said amused. I am amazed at your people skills, and without even passing as a human or even speaking, you have won the loyalty and friendship of others. And tell me, what is your se the secret to your charisma? Rusalka said nothing. She only turned a deeper crimson with a dab of milky green in the center. And picking up her period, he put it to his ear to listen, and he was making a new sound. However, it still did not resemble words, and to him, and to him it sounded like an uh, alien harp. You are right, Hyperion, Hyperion said Abel, nodding. And again, the Alpio made a strange, uh, stranger sound still, and chuckling Abel said, Maybe if you think it will help. And the Alpios eroded their tops, and for the smallest to largest, and Abel dipped his hand inside, and he felt a scratching sound, followed by the, by the earth to empty his insides, and he twitched while holding his insides, and he felt to him that he was convulsing, and he feared to have underestimated the duck the ductility of his body, and for a moment he thought he felt a thought or a voice that said, I knew this was a bad idea. Abel, like he tried to mimic the, he tried to, be, he tried to mimic the form, so that we are ampio creatures, but it ended up, uh, but it ended up like harming him really badly. Abel awoke to find himself in bed, and he saw a guy that cleaning a milky, uh, cleaning a milky white liquid from the floor. And coughing, he asked, how long was I out? Giganta shrugged his shoulders and said nothing, and she continued her effort to try to clean the otherwise mirror from the ground. And after spending more minutes on this venture, she gave up and left the tent to sit outside and meditate. And she was not used to using tents since they did not have any windows. And Abel struggled to get up, and he reached for his staff for support and made his way towards a strange bottle. It felt like touching a jellyfish, and using his magic, he levitated the entire substance and he placed it inside a beaker. And after clapping the top, he sent it to his tower for further study. And he greedily wondered if he had come out, if he had come out of him. And after feeling his eyes, he became convinced that nothing was missing. And since all appeared to be well, he pushed the entire incident to the back of his mind. A half an hour passed, and Abel noticed that it was close to dust. And going inside his tent, he saw Gargantua cooking soup by the fire. And the birds were perished on the surrounding trees, and whenever a farmer passed by, he could not help but stare at the birds with suspicion. And Gargato said nothing as she handed Abel his soup, and slowly he nursed it, and soon drank it home. And the warmth of his first meal in death made him completely forget the imaginary sickness born from his failure to transform into the ampio like humanoids, humans, and he pondered if maybe he should have tried only one form. And the great had only analyzed one of the ampules, perhaps the rest were different types of beings. And his train of thought was interrupted when Gargantaras was, what, 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 repeated Abel, not understanding. Sighing, Garganta said, what do? It depends on the others, there's only so much a person can do alone, said Abel, staring at the flames. Fine vacation, head game goes, said Garganto. And after thinking of it, Abel realized what she was saying, and at the time to poke holes into the problem, he said, well, on to the next task at hand. Incidentally, do you guys continue with the full diplomacy? Garganta nodded in response. How did it go? Uh, as Abel, it should leave, answered Garganto. I can't help but feel we are waging a losing battle, and whether we want to or not, humans control a significant portion of the resources, especially now with most of the earth going into Erza or hiding away in the Morensis. And there really is nothing to share their progress, and if another retirement comes, we could be in serious trouble, said Abel more to himself.
much time? Uh, four minutes. And following his saying of that, Eva had the brilliant idea to help, uh, to help prosper non-humans and this would help serve as a buffer against the advancement of their belligerent human causes and in order to help them out, he needed to assess the situation as a whole. Through Edith, Eva was able to get a complete assessment of the life of the non-human population post-war and in the old days, non-humans enjoyed a certain degree of protection under the rule of law and they were technically be free, but their living conditions were worse than ever, and their patrons constantly abused and forcing them into a canon system, and others took to the high road like the earth and formed their own independent settlements. And the answer to the strategy was dealing with bandits raised and raised from the feudal lords, and the only ones not having this problem were the nymphs, and after the nymph lord was vanquished, the entire nymph race seemed to have gone, um, gone the way of the elves, only now the little people without any sort of powerful magic or stature were suffering the worst. And under this list included the goblins, the dwarves, the orcs, harpies, and satyrs. And after looking at the list, Abel noted that it followed closely the list of races that were almost annihilated by Bersamy. And a wise man was painted on his list as he thought of the new blood realm. And while the other species were quick on the update, the humans were still getting used to the idea of only being allowed to war in the summer. Like when Bersama died uh, from, from, from his carcass uh, emerged uh, when I, no, you know, Bersama was origi the original blood red, the original blood red because there was a natural order in the, in the continent that humans were only allowed to go to war in the summer months and the rest of the time they had to engage in the arts of peace. So that way, that way whether they want to or not, they, they had to they had to fight. They they weren't allowed to spend all of their time going to war and killing each other. Cause if they went to war in literally in any other time of the year, the the being known as blood red would come and like wipe out both armies. So yeah, so that's uh, so that was the so then when Bert when Bert the previous blood red uh, died, a new one was born in his place. The, the, the reach of that old order because he got tired of just being an arbiter of war and then he just decided to be a regular warmonger. So he wasn't acting the way that he was supposed to. Mm. But yeah, time? Uh, one minute, 30 seconds. Well, the other species, uh, after meditation on this and many other interesting facts, so it's able came up with this strategy. And the first thing he had to plan to do was leaving behind one of his white mages to run his little veterinarian business in Bisbee. And while waiting for his replacement, he spent days and nights writing and illustrating a medical book on treating pets and animals using human agriculture. And he also bought a farm and had one of the locals tend to it to grow medicine. And he started getting regular funding from the noble patrons whose pets he had treated. And he noted that he had the first me he had the first animal clinic in the entire in the entire continent. And it was ironic considering that Bisbee didn't have a barber or healer for his humans, but he did have a veterinarian. <laughs> No, no, the locals seemed to question the state of events, and for fun of the animals were their livelihood, and for novels their pets were their only true fed, and the trip back to Lusitania was an event, for, and he found his close companions and generals waiting for him at the tower, and the other as if nothing had, had, had happened, and Abel decided to follow in suit, Tybro? Eh, uh, 20 seconds. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah,